thank you very much for coming. This is the first and the second series of talks in the Global Health Academy in the University of Edinburgh. It's um, somewhere we're trying to bring together the PIs of the groups across the university to try and speak to each other from Little France, from George Square, from um, King's Buildings, or from the centre of town, to understand better about what each people, what each different group is doing. We're hoping over time to build up the numbers of people so we can create more collaborations and more um, relationships across the university because we are quite dispersed and we don't have a school of global health to give us a basic centre. So I hope you go away from this talk today enthused. We'll come back in a month's time with at least five friends. I'm sure there's some social media where you can do this to increase the number of people coming, try and get more of the PIs coming. And so the first speaker of this series is Dr. Claudia Pagliari. Pagliari, yes, not too bad. Who's the leader of the interdisciplinary group on um, e-health. And we talked about her work, also her leadership of the AMSC in um, global health and e-health. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good, thanks. I don't have a little uh, sort of uh, slide clicker, but Lisa's going to help me here. Um, thanks very much indeed. Um, I'm pleased to be able to open this uh, latest seminar series. And uh, thanks to Liz Grant and Lisa Wood for inviting me. Uh, if you go back, the um, yes, I think it seems to be having a life of its own there. <laughs> I did uh, give a version of this presentation at uh, one of the large events around infectious diseases that was organized in May. So some of you may have caught that on YouTube. So I hope, I, hope uh, I can add a little bit of a different slant on it for you today. I know that uh, many of you won't have been there. Um, um, as we're hearing, we've launched an MSc in Global eHealth now, which is focused on taking our work in ICT for health and extending that across the world. As we were becoming more and more involved in, in uh, work in Africa in particular, using different types of mobile technologies, uh, studying electronic health record systems and other types of information systems, uh, it, it seemed appropriate to, to take our degree program in health informatics and consider it with a more of an international perspective and it uh, fits very well under the Global Health Academy program. So why is ICT important for global health? We'll just uh, make a start. Uh, it's, it's a no-brainer to some extent, but let's have a look at the challenges. We face many long-standing challenges. As we all know, you'll all be familiar with the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, we're doing quite well on achieving some of them, not so well on achieving others. And there are many questions about why that would be. Uh, but the, uh, in the case of um, health, we're talking about particularly maternal health care challenges and the HIV epidemic, they're probably being attracting the greatest attention at neonatal deaths are still very high. At the same time, we have to consider, uh, as has been recognized in the Global Challenges uh, and uh, Global Academies Initiative at the university, that, that health is not an isolated thing. It happens in the round. Health is affected by many other aspects of development uh, or lack of development. Um, it's also affected by things like international conflict and poverty and all of these things, environmental change. It, it can't be considered purely in isolation and that's uh, the same for many other challenges in ICT and in health. Next slide please. Uh, so those are challenges but we all have some long-standing challenges that don't tend to get talked about so much in the context of global health which tends to be identified with uh, resource poor countries with the high levels of infectious disease and lots of maternal death from from poor services but there are long-standing challenges in other parts of the world as well and in all of the richer countries in the world our biggest problems are that we are getting fatter and as a consequence of getting fatter we're getting more long-term conditions and of course a good side uh, of our of our health is that we're getting older as well but likewise as we get older our propensity to to get long-term conditions increases and so we're now being faced with a ticking time bomb as many of the politicians call it where the sort of the burden of long-term conditions will soon overtake the capacity of health services to cope with them so this is very much the dominant agenda in Europe and uh, to some extent the United States at the moment. Next slide please. 
And of course there are new challenges all the time. We, the last time I, I gave a, a talk on this topic uh, to the Global Health Academy, the Ebola crisis hadn't really kicked in. People weren't really talking that much about the Ebola crisis and that really wasn't very long ago. It was just a few months ago. Now it's the major issue. Some of the students on our MSc programme were actually involved in international in, uh, in programmes dealing with the Ebola crisis, doing emergency response medicine, emailing and, and, and um, sending images back and so forth and coordinating services through ICT and likewise our colleagues in and the likes of Medic Mobile, uh, mobile uh, health uh, organization who, who we had give one of the global e-health talks last year also heavily involved in this uh, sort of situation and uh, uh, so and the World Health Organization issuing travel advice and so forth which also has implications for the issue of globalization, global transit, global movement of populations. We're getting cases now appearing in, in places like Spain and, and United States. Next slide, please. And just to, to put some more context around it, uh, we are in an environment, with, with not only with sort of uh, diseases spreading um, and uh, famine, natural disasters, warfare, but the consequence of this is that people are moving, that global migration is increasing a lot. Now what does that mean for a stable health system? What does that mean about your personal health information and where you take it with you? There are new challenges about the management of information about populations and about information from patients and individuals. And another challenge is around the lack, uh, as I'm sure those of you who are in the Global Health Academy will be well aware, the lack of trained medical practitioners in countries with very high healthcare needs. Uh, if you look at this map at the top, it's not very well displayed there. It's showing uh, physicians uh, per head of population. And really, in parts of Africa, we're talking uh, sort of one clinician for thousands of people in comparison with our own sort of luxury system, which we complain about all the time if we can't see our GP within you know within two days we tend to sort of get quite upset imagine if you are one of thousands of people having to deal with one person uh, absolutely dreadful and, and the other thing is that once they do get trained in America often or, or in other richer countries we're often providing scholarships for global development what happens they take off they take off and they go and work in other countries. They don't necessarily go back to their own countries of origin, which also uh, means that the problem is, is not necessarily solved. But there are ICT methods of slightly getting around that, which I'll come to shortly. Now, this area of e-health, global e-health, sits within a broader framework uh, of ICT for development. And I know some of, the, uh, some of you may, be, may have been working uh, in this area in other contexts. We, there's an MSc call, uh, or a, a module in this from the School of Social Sciences, for example. And this is around the development of, uh, of society, if you like, the building of infrastructures, <laughs> uh, the building of capacity uh, in poorer countries through the investments in ICT, information and communication technologies, which uh, we are, many people regard as a natural resource. It's not just in the under 25s in high income countries that believe they can't live without the internet anymore. There was a recent survey which seemed to suggest our young people, you know, they would rather turn off uh, the water supply than give up their internet connection uh, or their mobile phone contract. It becomes essential. It's like the I've blood. My son uh, uh, complains if I cut off his uh, his mobile phone allowance, all is his disaster. Whereas, of course, when I was growing up, there was never any such thing, and it was queuing for the telephone, which was more of a, a priority. But increasingly, we're recognising that these issues around communication and around information exchange are fundamental building blocks of strong 
systems, not just health systems, all sorts of systems, government systems, business <coughs> systems, educational systems. And a lot of invents, investment has gone into all of these areas over the years in this field which has devol evolved for some, for some uh, years. And uh, that's just a, a recent reference and a little model there. So it's, it's, it's not taking place alone. Next please. But the area of, sort of global e-health, uh, uh, many people have, have seen as, as being at the intersection. I don't know how well you can see this, but between global development, uh, engineering, because it involves technologies and machines, global public health, because it often involve, involves large populations and users and communities, and of course medicine at the top. And I think this is quite a nice way to represent it, really. Next slide, please. And there's quite a lot of um, also activity out there on the internet. Any, any Google search will bring, uh, if, you, if you configure it correctly, will bring up a number of uh, new blogs and policy reports, industry reports, um, reports from small development agencies, local, local case studies, looking at the ways in which ICT has been deployed for health. This is one from the IT, International Telecommunications Union, and they have been quite active in this area, in the whole area of global health for some time, global e-health. And they have uh, produced this nice report uh, very recently, in fact, uh, um, just on uh, e-health and achieving the MDGs. Next, please. Oh, the duplicate slide. This is actually comes from Rwanda, and it's uh, an example of uh, uh, it's just uh, uh, electronic health record implementation. I think it, it was uh, it, it was from the Rockefeller Foundation who've invested in this area. Next, please. So let's consider this. We have global health challenges, but we also have many uh, green shoots. And the green shoots come from the penetration of the internet. As I've said, internet is now being regarded as a natural resource, like water, like air, like greenery. Internet gives us strength. It, it, it helps us, uh, it, it, it helps to connect us and uh, it connects us to one another and it connects us to information. Um, and it enables us to self-manage, and it does all sorts of other things as well, and, and it's increasing all over the world, not just in North America and Western Europe, but pretty much everywhere we're having uh, increasing internet penetration. Next slide, please. Um, <laughs> here we are, this is just another example, and this is interesting, this came for a report earlier on this year, uh, and it just shows the ways in which we're using the internet in the various forms that we're using it. Uh, and who's using it? Urban and rural populations. But critically, we're gradually using it more and more on our mobile phones and our tablets. In fact, many people are getting rid of um, standard computers. Many people, likewise, are getting rid of their phone lines and they're going straight to mobile. Mobile is, especially with the penetration of tablets and smartphones and phablets as the latest one, which is your tablet and your phone combined. I've just ordered my first one, I'm very excited. Um, that is creating a whole new uh, generation of uses of the internet. And one of the things people do it for, as well, is for social networking. And that just doesn't mean just calling up your friend in a one-to-one. -one. It means collecting communities, joining uh, Twitter, sending out little messages uh, across the cybersphere, crowdsourcing other people's ideas about what you've said, generating your own databases or information with your Facebook profile and your particular needs, going onto specialist websites that contain um, information but also allow you to connect with other people with health conditions like you. Now you can see how that might be helpful in a global context. The internet doesn't respect borders. The internet is a universal phenomenon. Okay, so I can just as easily socially network with someone who has a good internet connection in um, Gabon as I, as I can do with someone in Dundee, potentially. So I think that has great, great, uh, great potential there, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Next slide, please. Oh. Okay, this was just... Uh, just indicating this point I made earlier about how much time we're spending on our mobiles now. Next, next slide, please. 
We know, uh, just coming back to the uses now of e-health or um, ICT in health, using again mainly higher income country examples to start with, but we know that people go on to the internet to find medical information. Uh, generally, we know this in high income countries, we even know medical professionals will go on to resources on the internet to find their information. That's well established. Now that information may be a supplementary add-on to our well-provided healthcare systems in the West, but it might be a vital lifeline for someone in a poor country. It might give them information, it might give them videos which help to demonstrate how they might want to self-care or, or uh, if they're a, a community health worker, how they might want to use a piece of medical technology that they otherwise were not trained to do. For example, very, very useful. And as I said, connecting people to connecting individuals with healthcare practitioners who can give them advice, showing them uh, images and, uh, and videos of other people self-caring in certain ways or talking about their illnesses uh, and giving them some sort of social support um, and also, uh, also seeking, seeking support uh, for their own particular health needs. For example, is there a community group that deals with um, terminal illness or something nearby that I can speak to for, for relatives of people with terminal illness who are, who are not coping well? Is there a specialist group? And that brings me to the point about segmentation. What's great about the internet and social media is that you're able to, with a little bit of searching, quickly find very, very specialist groups that suit you perfectly. They're not just um, a generic NHS website. They're there, they're very useful, but sometimes you want something very specific. So Patients Like Me is a site in the USA. I say site, but actually it's a whole enterprise. Um, coming in, don't worry. <laughs> Um, which was designed to allow people to find other people like them, particularly with rare conditions. And this is now extended to all sorts of other conditions and people began looking for social support. They began looking for um, maybe suggestions on medical solutions to their rare condition that maybe established medicine didn't have an answer for. They then started self-organizing into groups and crowdsourcing funding and recruiting scientists and organizing controlled trials and sharing their data so they move from the point of being an isolated individual with a sick child with a rare condition that no one could help with into part of a community into a self-organizing scientific system. Isn't that wonderful? So there's great potential for that to happen on a global level. So there we are, that's just the internet. Information is just one thing. Next please. And of course a lot of this, though, is down to strategy uh, when it comes back to health systems. I've been talking about the, the general ecosystem of personal care and the citizen. Back to governments. What are governments doing about this? Well, some governments are doing very well. They have very well-organized e-health strategies, or what they're called health information strategies, or health information technology strategies. Some of them spend billions and billions of dollars and pounds on these things. We had a national program for IT here, which unfortunately was criticized as being the most expensive failure ever, uh, but actually wasn't that much of a failure because it has translated into benefits for infrastructure and technologies in the UK. Uh, in the United States at the moment, they're investing millions, billions of dollars trying to get electronic health systems health information systems into primary care, into hospitals, to try and join up the health system, which was very fractured before, very disaggregated. This is a way of sh enabling data to flow between organizations, so all very good. A and these are parts of large national strategies. Elsewhere in the world, strategy and policy can be a bit more challenging. Partly, your governments often are not necessarily as lined up in some parts of the country uh, of the world than in others, where, where your government might be very, uh, very well organised, structured, have very long-standing uh, governance arrangements, hierarchies of power, um, etc. Good information systems underpinning them. Elsewhere, you might be in a country as a new country, or country is uh, overcoming uh, war. So how? What, what, what's the advantage of policy there? Policy is hard to do. 
Uh, and we know from the Global Observatory for eHealth that the World Health Organization organizes that you know, they're trying to push forward um, recommendations for effective strategy in e-health, recommendations for not only designing and uh, your strategy but also being able to implement it and it is achieving some success, it is helping to, to standardise practice to an extent but there are challenges and many countries get neglected. Countries that sometimes don't get neglected, they get neglect, don't get neglected because there was a crisis. So for example, Rwanda, mass genocide, completely almost a kind of social scorched earth now one of the most highly functioning health information systems in the whole of Africa. Fantastic. Why is that? International investment, incentives for change, recognition that like providing sanitation, providing good ICT infrastructure can help you to manage resources, can improve your information governance, can, can improve your governance of your health system by making things much more, trans, uh, uh, much more transparent and accountable. And that's not to say money hasn't disappeared down a magic hole. It has. But Nonetheless, more of it can get swept up by this big net we call information governance. So I think there's, there's a lot of potential there, and you're welcome to read some more about that, obviously. There, next slide, please. Uh, oh yes, I mentioned this before. There are other concerns that, that maybe one could put on the map as a global issue. Uh, this is just a little bit of a distractor right now. Uh, we don't quite know how it's going to pan out. Uh, but I was discussing this with my students just last week and they were, had quite a vibrant discussion about this. There's a sort of plan by ICANN, the international organization that is charged with managing internet domain names. To, uh, they've basically got a big auction to sell off loads of internet domain names. And amongst those are health-related names. And there was some research that indicated that might mislead people into thinking they were going to a bona fide site when actually they were going to some snake oil salesman. And the World Health Organization got very upset about this, and they still are. And they've been agitating for change and trying to get ownership of these really important high-level domain names as, uh, as, as, because they think it's a, you know, health is a fundamental human right, and they're the organization charged with preserving those fundamental human rights, and information and control of the internet represents one form of that. And I think they are gaining some traction and have managed to get some, uh, some uh, ownership of certain domain names. So that, that's a sort of, you know, it, we're working in a whole digital economy here, and we can't decouple health from that. Um, another slide, please. Okay, back to why we want to use ICT in health. Well, I talked about connecting people. I talked about connecting services and managing systems. And a lot of that has to do with having an effective infrastructure. Just as we have telephone exchanges and just as we have um, sewerage systems and, and, and so forth, certain underpinning infrastructures are essential to make our societies and our, uh, function well. Right? Stop everyone falling out because there are people um, throwing their toilets out of the window like they used to do in sort of uh, out of the windows in the old town in the past. Um, uh, that no longer happens because we have an infrastructure and that's quite good. There's less, less people getting upset because something was thrown on their head just to boil it down to the simple, simple things. So we need infrastructures for all sorts of things. And information infrastructures, or what some people have called infostructures, <laughs> um, have been, uh, are really at the root of where the big investments, the big government investments have gone. And the purpose of that is mainly to connect up health systems to, you know, on top of producing cabling and Wi-Fi networks, it's also about things like standardizing data. So making sure that the information contained in one system is structured and formatted in a way that it can be shared by another system, that the software in one system can be shared with an, uh, can share messages with another system. It's called health information exchange. And it sounds simple, but it isn't because this, we're working in an environment in which many different organizations have bought different products from different providers who have sewn them up into contracts where they can't buy other people's technology. And as a, as a consequence, 
um, sometimes those systems haven't been interoperable. They haven't been able to speak to each other. And this is, has stopped us from really strengthening our health systems through this integrative power. And that is now changing. So we're integrating information uh, and a proce about processes, people, uh, flows of medicines, uh, costs, bed uses, personnel, um, patient health issues, outcomes of data, outcomes of different types of health interventions. And importantly, a good infrastructure allows us to coordinate healthcare as well. Uh, because, for example, it allows um, several providers caring for a person with a complex condition to be aware of the other conditions they have. Or even if they're suffering from diabetes, there may be several practitioners needed in order to manage that same patient and they need to share information. But also it, it coordinates services as well. So things like responding to emergencies, uh, you know, if there's a national catastrophe, for example, a bomb blows up, you need to be able to coordinate. You do that through your strong systems. And the other good reason for big systems, and you'll have heard this term big data getting bandied around a lot. Big data sort of just really means large quantities of data from large systems, often complex systems. Um, it's also valuable for these other global health purposes. And one is surveillance. Now, if you imagine your system allows you to conduct a surveillance of, you know, who's getting flu this year? What drugs might be needed? You might also know uh, a bit about risk factors for, for, um, for um, that, that might lead someone to, to end up in a long-term nursing care, like a fall or something like that. You, and they might be predictable from their records. It's quite good, you can surveil, you can understand what's going on, you can maybe do some prediction. Those systems can, some elements of them, can be global. They can connect to other systems. Now obviously if everyone has a strong healthcare infrastructure and those are all connected, you have a wonderful sort of big global information world. You can share information about you know, who's moving where with Ebola or whatever it happens to be and how patterns of health and disease change, where you might need to invest your resources, send your people. So surveillance is, is absolutely vital for health conditions. And likewise, as I've said, it's about research as well. So why do we know what, what, what investments deployed where under what conditions are likely to produce the most cost-effective benefits for patients? for example, whether they are in terms of hospital building or whether they're new medicines or whatever it happens to be. And likewise for planning ahead. We have our infrastructures, we have our information systems, we have the insights, we have the analytics, also a trendy phrase at the moment that allows us to predict. So this is, this is why there's so much attention on this. And we're getting, we're, we're quite far ahead in Scotland on this because we have the benefit of something called a community health index number, which is a, a single number uh, uh, which is, a, is applied to every single health transaction, which means your computers can all start to, to link their health information. And it's good for research and it's good for patient care. Next, please. So, yes, uh, this is just a status report uh, on uh, different uh, countries and what they use their systems for. Some for gathering health surveys, they may be uh, collecting data from uh, community health workers' mobile phones or from regional health centres and regional health information systems and bringing them together, uh, and also social surveys, surveillance, patient monitoring, uh, of course, in hospital and outside, and registration of vital events. So, next slide, please. This is something also I, I wanted to mention. Technology costs money, and the people who put together technology very often are doing it for business purposes. Uh, and a lot of countries can't afford that. A lot of people can't afford that. So there's been a great movement in the ICT for development world in open software and open systems. And these are very often donated, in a sense, by people working collaboratively in their own time or at low pay or you know, collaborating anyway to produce technologies which are not pinned down, which their software code is made freely available. 
uh, it, there's no license, you don't have to pay for it, you can maybe customize it to your own setting. And this has been very successful and one of the, the best examples is Open MRS, medical, medical Record System. And this has been deployed very successfully across uh, many parts of Africa and one of our global e-health speakers who came last year, um, Hamish Fraser, was involved in this, is also tutoring on our course and, and that's who I got this slide from. Um, and it's been so popular, the fact that people in a low-income country can take something which is actually a perfectly good electronic health record system, software, and deploy it and customize it themselves. And if they've got a problem, they can network using the internet to somebody who can help them with that. And there are developers all over the world able to help them with that. So this is spread out now is in clinical use in over 40 developing countries now. If you had gone to one of the big expensive providers that we pay for, you'd be talking millions and millions of dollars and pounds on these things. It doesn't have to be that way. And I think we're going to see some changes globally on that, even in high income countries. But I mean, they're not the most sort of sophisticated systems, but they do the job and that's what counts. Next slide, please. Now there's some interesting things going on in global health surveillance that you might not necessarily have thought about. We've talked about health infrastructures, these big systems that collect data from people that turn up at a health facility. Something's recorded, it goes into a database, those databases uh, share data and you understand things generally and that's how we, we get most of our national vital statistics or health statistics um, for most uh, population health purposes. However, a lot of the time you can find out what's going on in people's health in, in, across the world and in populations by looking at what people do on the internet. And there's been a great deal of um, attention focused on mining searches of Google and things like this to look at what people are looking for. And there was some work, you can go to the next slide I think. Um, Oh no, go back again, thanks. Um, there was, there's been some work particularly, Google has been quite active on this and they produced this thing called Google Flu which became a real sort of uh, flagship project for global health surveillance because what they found, and it's slightly less reliable as, than it was but it's been cascaded to other conditions, what they found was that people's searches on the internet for the word flu or words that were flu-like correlated very well with what data had been collected in national health information systems. Okay, the official data sources collected by doctors and nurses and put into databases. And what's the other advantage of having, of, of, of looking for these signals on the internet, on people's Google searches? Okay. Time. It takes quite a long time for you to actually take data, collect it in a health facility. Sometimes it's got to be handwritten in some health facilities, some part of the world, and then sent on someone in a motorbike who goes to a regional health information system and then codes it on the computer, and then it takes a little while before it goes to a national reporting system. Okay, and that happens to us too. Um, it takes time. Now what happens if you have something that's breaking out quickly? you might not be able to gather that information straight away. Now we know from this work with Google and, and others, and there's been Twitter mining work and so forth, that there are quite good associations or correlations between these internet searches and what you're seeing in official data sets. So that's actually quite advantageous when you come to looking at these um, infectious disease outbreaks. It's being used uh, currently. Next slide, please. <coughs> Some of the data are from these internet searches um, and some of them are from devices. So this is from the SARS outbreak and there have been many other examples. I'm sure the Ebola crisis is, is a great example. I was talking about mobile earlier. Mobile's come a long way since this crisis happened. Mobile is now the internet in your pocket before it was a phone. Okay, the things happen very, very quickly. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, people, and this happened also with the, the earthquakes in Japan was another example. People had, in New Zealand, their mobile phones, they are there physically present when something is happening. There's a help, someone has fallen, or they find a working, uh, working toilet, or, or a hospital with supplies in it that hasn't been, uh, you know, that hasn't fallen to the ground in the earthquake, or, uh, or they see someone who looks like they might be suffering from this a Asian flu, or whatever it happens to be, or, um, and they're able to report that 
to some global surveillance system or some local surveillance system using their mobile phone. Rapidly, signals turn up. Rapidly, you start to get heat maps of what's going on, and you can respond to that. And this was used very successfully uh, as one of the early examples back in the day of the SARS uh, epidemic in China and Hong Kong. I just flag that just now. Next slide, please. I'm aware of the time. Oh. Oh yes, yes, uh, that's uh, just some people shedding a little cynicism on the Google flu phenomenon, but I think that's been addressed now. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I've come to this already. I've talked about people connecting with one another in cyberspace, often using their mobile phones, socially networking, crowdsourcing support for one another, crowdsourcing solutions to their problems. Um, I've talked about mobile phones being used to capture things in real time while they're happening and report them back to a central surveillance system. But there's more going on in this area. Some people don't like the term crowdsourcing. I, I don't mind it. It just means uh, going to populations that are distributed uh, in ways that are sometimes not always intended. But there are these, uh, the, I would just recommend if anyone wants to read a bit more, there's a recent review on crowdsourced research. So this is research that can take place when you, you ask people, you're basically asking people to report on various health indicators, for example, or to try something. It's becoming quite, quite popular now. But crowdsourcing also works in other ways. There are also innovations around poverty alleviation using microfinance on, uh, on mobile, phone, m mobile phone micropayments, for example, can help with health because it can help particularly women in sort of small businesses to get a leg up in the world. And, uh, and this allows them to purchase more health care. So, uh, so there's very much a theory out there that poverty is being reduced with this microfinance. It doesn't always work. Sometimes it's misused. But generally, it seems to be quite positive. And in some parts of the world, where there is no sensible way of paying medical staff, there might be a kind of health system of sorts, but very often doctors are getting left without any pay for months at a time. How do you get around that? How do you, do you, still, do you still manage to work? Well, there are these new microfinancing systems coming up. So, health professionals signing up to microfinancing uh, financing agreements. I'm not quite sure how they get the money. But the point is, people are aggregating their activities. They're aggregating information. They are trying to work collaboratively. So it's no longer just you on your own, the doctor who's not been paid. There's a whole load of other people out there that have ways of getting money. And maybe you can pool that resource, so at least you know you're going to eat that month. Quite, quite good here. Uh, next, and of course, yes, research. And some of those systems are being used successfully to, uh, to incentivize, not just pay uh, professionals and patients. This was, um, this was uh, an example from Text to Change. It's one of the mobile health um, programs. And they provide a micropayment to a doctor when they do something that they're supposed to do, and they can verify it using their mobile phone. In this case, it was for TB. And they did some creative things with patients as well uh, by integrating a means to a urine testing strip that allowed you to verify that the patient had taken their TB medication that day. And when the patient did take it, they got a mobile micropayment. Uh, and so com rates of compliance, rates of, of actual uh, uh, accurate identification and treatment of patients increased amongst the professionals and the patient's compliance increased. So quite creative. And, and I think we'll be looking at more and more of those mobile digital incentives in Western countries as well. And I can see more of it coming in. Next slide, please. And I mentioned this at the beginning, but I think it's just worth pointing out again that a lot of health systems suffer because they're poorly managed and because they're corrupt. And the corruption comes from poor management, poor transparency, poor accountability. And Increasingly, technologies, uh, better infrastructures, allow you to assess you know, what uh, what payments have led to what products have led to what interventions have led to what outcomes and who's had access to what that's helpful but likewise social social curation is also vital 
So increasingly in some countries, patients and doctors themselves are being enabled with mobile phone apps that allow them to report when someone has stepped over the line, when someone has been engaged in some corrupt practice, like allowing people to jump a queue in a hospital because, they, um, because they've paid a little bribe. So they can be named in shame now. And there's evidence that that does seem to be cleaning up systems of governance, policing even, in India was, was one example, government corruption, but critically medicine. And so it might be a tool to improve equity simply through the fair distribution of resource. And I, I would say it's well worth looking at that. And, uh, and here was a, um, there's an international network for economics and conflict, and they are, uh, reporting on a, a new app for fighting corruption in Ghana using this method. Quite interesting. I'd like to know more about that if anyone's got any ideas. Next slide, please. Uh, I think maybe this is just about mobile health and, uh, and all the things that we can do. Next slide, please. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, it was just really to illustrate the point that because mobiles are small and light and they're getting cheaper, we're able to disseminate them and provide healthcare services in places which previously it was unimaginable. So remote villages in different parts of the world where you're miles and miles away from the nearest healthcare practitioner, able to get your phone to use for multiple purposes. And these give people opportunities. And a lot of people have said, well, really the advantage, and it is true, most advantages from these systems in terms of health have come from cheap phones, ordinary phone, mobile phones with SMS technology. Now, SMS is extremely powerful. The big technology companies don't want you to know that because they want to sell you whizzy, fancy apps that will cost you a lot of money. But actually, SMS is, is a hugely powerful and cheap, almost free tool, very useful. Having said that, there are questions about the digital divide still arising. Uh, people have said, oh, oh, well, poor people will never get mobile phones and, therefore, and, and computers, therefore they will never be as, uh, you know, as well off uh, in terms of information as the rest of the world and their health disparities will, will grow as a consequence of this. Not so. People started getting these mobile phones. The latest sort of uh, incarnation of that is the slew of smartphone apps around Apple's products and services. Now, the latest release of Apple's iHealth platform, I think it's called iHealth, it's a health platform, um, is designed to uh, ensure that all the developers of all the different health and medical apps, that includes things for monitoring your heart rate or uh, checking how many steps you've walked today or helping with your depression management, all sorts of things, will be able to send data into Apple's platform. Now, they're promising that that will be secure uh, and therefore people will be able to create dashboards of their health and it will all be good and, and it has a lot of potential. But of course it led a lot of people to say, well, that's going to increase health disparities even more because the richer people not only have better health care, they're better sort of uh, nutrition, they're better off anyway. Now they've got more information, they, they had more information through the, getting the internet earlier so they were able to know more about health and now they've got these self-help tools as well. So they're going to get so much better off and everyone else will stay down at the bottom. Well, as it happens, uh, Google also released a phone in India about two weeks ago. There's also a smartphone, cheap smartphone. I'd like to get one. It's only $100, which maybe is not so cheap when you live in some of these countries. But it's kind of verging on the affordable with all the Android apps uh, able to, to work with that. So it's not simply a high-income country thing. And I, I, I think whilst penetration of smartphones and apps is still fairly fairly weak in many parts of the world, it's not going to be long before they become endemic parts of our society everywhere. And, and I really think there is an opportunity to bring people up. You can self-help, you can source help using your mobile phone, which will bypass some of that need that was left behind by the lack of medical practitioners. So I'm quite optimistic, but there hasn't been enough research on it yet. Next slide, please. Uh, these are just examples, someone testing with what was a PDA. Uh, you know, it's worth saying that a lot of the health care in, in, in poorer countries is provided by community health workers who are uh, usually untrained or little trained and unpaid or little paid. But they can still be their, their skills and their ability to form a, you know, a well-functioning health care role is augmented greatly by having technologies. They are, they, they, they sort of, 
create almost expertise in a little box. Okay, and they give people confidence as well. Next slide, please. And, and increasingly, there's all of this whizzy, tiny digitized uh, point of care testing technology being linked up with mobile phones as well. There's been a lot of investment in that recently. So increasingly, people will have a laboratory on a chip, as it were, or little devices that can quickly gather what, until quite recently, involved large machines and satellites no longer. They can involve little things that you can take with you on your bicycle and you can, and you can test with. Um, uh, there are you know, disease monitoring uh, tools for infection and also uh, uh, heart monitoring and other kinds of, uh, of uh, biomedical sensor systems uh, and diagnostic systems. And I think that's, that's, again, going to permeate into the lower income countries soon. Yes? Oh yes, I was just saying that really HIV has been one of the success stories in mobile health, a big, chiefly through SMS, reminding people to take their drugs and to turn up for their appointments. Um, you know, you wouldn't think something could be so transformational, but probably more useful than, than, uh, than the drugs actually at the moment, uh, in terms of, of, well the drugs obviously are a partner in this, but behaviour, behaviour is what got people into this in the first place, and behaviour supported by mobile phones will, I think, help to get us out of it. So, next slide, please. And increasingly, yes, uh, maternal and child health are being uh, greatly supported with these as well. Mothers being uh, guided in what they should do, how their symptoms, uh, you know, w w what their symptoms indicate, uh, at what stage of pregnancy are they, what sh they should be eating, and for their babies, when they might be due to receive their immunizations and, s and so forth. And, and there was, there's some suggestion that some of these are engineering and empathy as well. They're creating communities. They're not just providing you with information. They're providing you with sort of sisterhood. They're providing you with some sense of, of belonging and some sense of um, just general social support. Next slide, please. And of course, um, in our own higher income countries, we're all getting sick from long-term conditions. And this is shed it's moving over to the, to the uh, developing countries now. Long-term condition management is very much a matter for ourselves. Because of the shifting burden of healthcare and the, 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 the greater proportion of need to provision of medical care, uh, the more attention is coming down to the individual all the time to self-care, to self-manage, to be their own doctor, to be their own nurse. To, to, to manage that themselves. And these devices, which allow, this is a diabetes self-testing tool which links to your mobile phone, allows you to do that. And increasingly we're working into, so that, that's the latest in the wearables world. You might have heard of the Nike Fit Bands and all of these sort of uh, jawbone things. Um, these wearable technologies have really, really taken off this year. And in fact, they're almost moving beyond that now. People are talking about uh, going from wearables to, to invisibles, and the invisibles will be things that you either hide inside your clothes or you actually sort of uh, embed inside your body, and they can be monitoring you all the time, or things that live in your home and sort of uh, monitor you in some way and give you various helpful advice. Um, so it, it's quite a, it, it's definitely worth watching, and I think. The point of it, really, is that we're not simply leaving people to their own devices. We're not simply saying, we can't cope with you, therefore you're on your own. We're saying, well, here's a way for you to be able to manage yourself in between seeing us, uh, and, uh, and that will help to reduce the burden if society all cooperates. Next slide, please. But there are a few challenges out there, and this is just stolen from another slide. There are questions, all of this relies on data, information, Information coming about you from, the, from your doctor's surgery or from your mobile device or from your telehealth care remote video consultation with your doctor. It's data, it's information, and some of that is quite private. Okay, you wouldn't want everybody knowing about it all, but we need the data in order to do these surveillance exercises, in order to do the research that will lead to new innovations. So there are challenges there. And some people feel, Okay, there's a the common good argument is one and the individual privacy, that there's been sort of a little tussle between those two camps. 
But in terms of global health, there's been some concern that these uh, issues around privacy and confidentiality and information protection have not been given the same weight in some poorer countries. Partly because the need to receive health care was greater than the need to protect privacy, whereas we're all in a well catered for world where we worry about our meta needs. It's things like how, how happy we are today or how much our digital privacy has been protected. That's important to us. But if we were living without food and sanitation and, and illness all around us, actually getting the information from A to B that might help us might be more of a priority. But that doesn't mean we should neglect information privacy. And there's also been some suggestion, I had again a discussion with my students about this last week, that there might be some sort of data colonialism going on, some idea that, that there might be a big brother in a pharmaceutical company somewhere in the world or a or genomics company is, is basically hoovering up data from people that don't quite realise what its value is and repurposing it. For, sell, for selling on elsewhere. And, and the, so these are the sorts of ethical dilemmas that we have. I think maybe that's, a, that's taking it a bit far, but I, I still, I, I do agree with the principle. Next slide, please. And some of the terms that are out there in our own environment, in Scotland, in Edinburgh, uh, we have these large data centers now. We're doing integrated data research, data linkage research, but some of the terms that are being used out there in the media, in the business sphere, in government, a little bit worrying. Data exploitation is my favourite because that, you know, exploitation doesn't sound very nice, does it? And some people feel they are being exploited. And if you look at the global picture, I think we, we have we've got still got a few issues to concern ourselves with. Next slide, please. But we are doing various types of public engagement around that to try and make sure that we know what's acceptable and unacceptable to people in the sharing of their telehealth data, in the sharing of their electronic health records for research. What, you know, what, what are people willing to put up with and not, and for what benefits in return? And that's been quite useful. But I would say it's time for a global project on that. So I'm just putting that out there if anyone would like to fund this. Uh, next slide, please. And just finally, a plug for our MSc in Global eHealth, uh, which we're really delighted. Liz is a co-director of the course. Um, we're really delighted about this because we've had a, a, re a lot of interest internationally on this, uh, far more interest than there is funding, uh, than, than people have th th that have funding. So we are seeking funding for, for some of these brilliant people, uh, often in low-income countries. But we've got a good crop of, of students involved in some really amazing work, some of them, in low-income countries and high-income countries, integrating health information systems, providing emergency response to Ebola, all sorts of these, all sorts of things, mobile health systems, uh, international uh, uh, databases for people that travel, various, uh, various programs of activity. So we, we're optimistic about learning as much from our students as, as they are from us. And it's, it's creating a great community uh, which supplements the research and development we're already doing in global health. So um, if you want to know more about that, please just have a look at the website or give us a ring. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, sure. Any questions?